We had a good time this morning already. I, um, um, uh, as some of you know, I'm very personal in, in how I move, and so to me, there's no strangers. And so I act like I know people always due to the fact that you that are born again, whether you realize it or not, we're going to be together always any old way. <laughs> and so some of you better get used to the, some of us because you're going to be with us any old way. <laughs> and most likely the one that you really don't want to get used to is the one you're going to be stuck with. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know that out, out, out front. Um, I want to thank uh, Kit and Vicki for having me um, come. I really enjoy whenever I come here, me and Kit has a bonding together. He's on the, one of those um, people that I send out uh, text to to pray for me wherever I go. And so we have a connection, you know, really all year round because we're always going somewhere. We're, we're, we're all over the United States and, and the, uh, uh, even out of, out of the country. I'm spending a lot of time in upstate New York and, and Vermont. You know, I was surprised how much time I'm spending in Vermont. You know, but God has me up there a whole lot, uh, 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 usually during the summertime, and which is a blessing. <laughs> you know? um, but the reality of it is I, I just uh, uh, find myself in Vermont, never thought I would be up in that part of the of the area ministering but God opened up the door and so we spent a lot of time in Vermont. Vermont is a state in the United States Amen. and next to Texans they probably have more pride than anybody. As far as they're concerned they won the Revolution War, the Civil War, the War of 1812. Without a Vermonter you wouldn't be here. I'm telling you that right now. Anybody from Vermont? <laughs> you know. We have some books in the back. We have a woman's stand. Marilyn put it together. It tells you what she did to get the results she wanted. I'm going to show a clip in a little while. My heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. I was what you consider clinically dead. So it tells you what she did to get the results she wanted. 29 different things went wrong with this body, and God healed all 29 and didn't leave a residue. One of the things I point out, yeah, that's worth clapping for. One of the things I point out in this book that I really thought was, was fascinating, even after I came back, they didn't think I would make it. Um, they had uh, put a tube down my throat. I was, in, I was um, on a kidney dialysis machine because my kidneys had stopped operating. I couldn't breathe and all that. And uh, they went to Maryland and they said that your husband will probably have brain damage because if you didn't know this, if you lose oxygen to your brain anywhere from five to eight minutes, usually it's done with. And I was ta we're talking about an hour and 45 minutes. And I love what she said, you guys. When the doctors came to her, she didn't badger the doctor, get after the doctor or anything. She said, it doesn't have to be that way. Amen. You know? And what she was going by is that I have a God that says he can do anything. And so if my husband needs his brain to be set right, my God could do that. And so I love that because I really believe some of you out there need to start going and saying it doesn't have to be that way. Amen. You know, I say that because I, I, I think it's just a, it's a really simple statement. You don't have to remember that much. All you have to remember, you got a God. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Is that good news? The other book is Deep Worship in Heaven. Uh, it tells you what it was like for me to be with the Father and Jesus in heaven and all of creation coming together to tell our Father how much we love him. That's all worship is. That's what I really, really you know, I, did, I haven't done this. Um, but remember, make sure that, unless you've already done it, make sure all the worship team gets one of these books. Wherever I go, I make sure that the worship team has this book because one of the reasons that it's written is for the worship team because I'm hoping it inspires them to move into a different area with God uh, and creativity of worship, okay? So just so make sure that we, they get the book, okay? And it's not one I want them to, I want to make sure it's a gift to them, okay? Because one of the things in this book that really uh, I, I like is when, when we get to that portion of me saying it's my turn to give God praise, I remembered that the Holy Spirit on the inside of me partnered with my spirit to come up with the words to tell my God how much I love him. Woo! Now, the, the fascinating thing about that is, is that he does that even now yeah. with us. 
that are in this room, when, when we have that moment of, of praising God, really it's the Holy Spirit, God Almighty himself, coming in line with your spirit to tell him how much you love him. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if you know how great that is. Some of you are trying to come up with words and you don't have to. You just have to rely on the Holy Spirit. He knows the words. Is that good news? And then the last book here, I said it in the first service. I felt like God um, wanted me to do this. Tim knows this. Uh, I want to make sure all the youth in this, in this church, the, the teenagers, get a free one of these. So I asked him to send me the, the number that he needs, and I'll ship them out here so that we get. The main reason for that is this is the overview, really, of what I experienced there. There's no way I can talk about everything that I experienced in heaven, but I do give you, a, like, a synopsis, and it's like me having a flyby, and I say, this is what I saw, this is what I saw, this is what I saw. But I say this, and I always say it almost everywhere I go, is that uh, uh, there's a lot of Scripture, and 99% of everything I experience I can find in the Word of God. I always tell people my story doesn't prove the word of God. The word of God proves my story. And the reason I say that is because I want you to really rely on your word. I really want you to understand it's in the word, you know. And and, and most of the time someone will have an experience and they'll say, well, that, that really isn't in the word, but not everything that God has done is in his word. Number one, I always say, how do you know that? Do you know everything in the word? You guys get that? I, don't, I haven't known anybody that knows everything in the Word of God. But they can tell you what's not in there. <laughs> you, know? you know? I thought there was many things that I experienced with the Father and Jesus that's in the Word of God. And, and, and I was telling somebody, it wasn't like I went there and I tried to find it. I'm a Bible reader. It was so great to read something and say, oh, there it is, oh, there it is, oh, there it is. Because when I got to heaven, he blew a ton of my boxes apart, but he didn't go outside his word. You guys got to grab that. I'm, uh, uh, um, we got to make sure we get Kit some more books to give away because he's going to give these away uh, later on. And I was just using those as an example. But Kit's going to give those away. I want to show a video. It's a short one. And the reason I'm showing it for one reason, there's an agenda here. Um, some of you may say, well, did this man really die? Well, what was done a few years ago is the actual doctor that was in the room when my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes, he did a, a, really a number of programs, but this is one that I like, um, was done by the 700 Club. And the 700 Club just didn't say we're going to do a show on Dean Braxton and put him on TV. They did six months of investigation. They wanted to make sure that what we had been saying for the first five years was true. And you'll probably say, why did they wait so long? Well, the main reason they waited so long is, uh, is because no doctor would come forward. And the reason doctors didn't come forward because the, 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 what happened in the hospital was their fault of me dying. And most of the hospitals didn't want to, want to come forward because they didn't want uh, to be in litigation. They thought we were getting the information so that we could go back and sue them. I always tell people, you go to heaven and come back and see how many people you sue. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is not in you. The reason we got the information because we wanted to tell you how great your God is. Amen. Did you hear how I said that? I could say how great my God is, but you that are born again, he's your God too. Yes. All right. So I want to show this clip because it has the actual doctor, Dr. Rigge. He wasn't the one that caused the issue. He was the one that was called in to clean up the mess. But he was in the room when my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. So let's go ahead and listen to him. I did not think he was going to survive. I, and I, in a way, I, I told his wife that, you know, now well, we have just to pray and, and wait because there is nothing else I can do. I believe in healing. I believe that God is a healer. And uh, I was trusting God for Dean's healing. Three days later, Dean woke up. He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Despite doctors' concerns that Dean's prolonged ordeal would leave him impaired or even worse, there are no signs that Dean even had a brush with death. He's the picture of health. In fact, the staff at St. Francis Hospital dubbed him the Miracle Man. It's a miracle that he's alive. There's no question about it. It is a miracle. Yeah, he's somebody alive, that he's talking, that he has no brain damage. Uh, but but this, this is very exceptional because he was really, really dead for, for a long time. (laughs) 
You know, um, I always tell people, I can prove I died. That's the easy part. You heard the doctor. The man was really, really dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> I really think the second really was for him because when they interviewed him, the 700 Club said he brought out the EKG. That was five years later. He's looking at it, and he starts crying. You know what I mean? Because look at me. This man did not have oxygen to his body for an hour and 45 minutes. There's no way I should be able to think or even talk to you according to scientists. Okay? Uh, 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 I was not only what we would call biologically being dead, that means your, your, your lungs and your heart are not operating, I was also what you call brain dead because my brain was not operating for that time frame. If you want to look at the next, and most of the medical people tell me this, the next area is being biologically dead. After 17 minutes, your body starts to deteriorate when it doesn't have blood or oxygen going through it. And there were parts of my body that died, my toes. My toes had died. They were planning on bringing me back in the hospital and zipping off all 10 of my toes when I had enough strength. All right? But you know what your God did? Healed all 10 of my toes. Okay? Now, I can tell you this. People checked it out. I had the Insight uh, Edition one time come and said that they wanted to do a story on me um, because they were trying to prove that near-death experiences don't happen. But after they did all the research, they came back and said, no, we can't use your story. It's too true. <laughs> like, I was going to be disappointed that they were going to say I'm a liar. <laughs> you guys... And so I always tell people, I can prove I died. That's the easy part. Hour and 45 minutes, that's what the medical records say. That's not me saying that. But I get to say this to you. I was born again. I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I had the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of me. And as I said earlier, and as I said a lot of places, I went where Christians are supposed to go. It's not unusual for Christians to go to heaven. That's what happens to us when we leave our body. That's the norm. And I know some of you right now said that's your belief system, and I'm going to say this. You'll find out. <laughs> I don't have to argue with you. don't have to debate you. You're going to find out because everybody on the planet is going to leave their body sooner or later. But us that are connected to Jesus are going where he is. You know, trying to tell this uh, around the world, I use the Bible a whole lot. Sometimes people get upset because they say, you use a lot of scriptures, even Christians, kid. They say, you use a lot of scriptures. And I tell people, wait a minute. I'm trying to explain an eternal realm and a temporal realm. You know, I believe that the Bible was inspired by God, the Spirit. And if anybody knows how to talk about spiritual things, it's God Almighty. I'm going to be way short in everything I tell you today. But if I can give you a scripture, you that are born again, you can go and read it and God can take you further. He wants you to know more. You know? So I use the word of God because I can't explain everything in the five senses. I can tell you what I saw, but I use the word L-I-K-E, L-I-K-E, -E, yeah, L-I-K-E, -E, a whole lot. It means like this. And if you read your Bible a lot of times in Revelation, when John is trying to explain things, he uses the word like a whole lot. Ezekiel uses the word like a whole lot. Daniel uses the word like a whole lot. They're saying, this is the best I can to explain that eternal thing in this temporal world. I can tell you what I experienced. I can tell you what I, what I uh, 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 saw, you know, in the sense of word like. But I can't tell you what I smelt and I can't tell you what I tasted. Whether you realize it or not, there's something on the planet here that's not there. It's called death and decay. And whether you realize it or not, you're smelling it all the time and you're tasting it all the time. Some of you when, you, when you go to a hospital, you don't like the smell of it because guess what you're smelling? Death and decay. Some of you, when you go to a retirement home, you don't like the smell of it because guess what you're smelling? Death and decay. Some of you, when you go to the outhouse, <laughs> you shouldn't like the smell of it. Because what are you smelling? Death and decay. It's all around us, you guys. 
The most I can do, Vicki, is pray that God gives you what it smells like there. And then you'll have that smell. But it will be hard for you to describe it on the planet due to the fact, even if you say it smells like flowers or floor smell or whatever scent, people are going to have to try to filter out death and decay. So I give you the word of God. Here it is, you guys. I start off with this scripture. Everywhere I go, usually I start off with this scripture. It's found in John, the 14th chapter, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I start off with that scripture because I always think, I can talk about heaven. I can tell you how wonderful it is. I can tell you all the great things about it. But if you don't know how to get there, what good is it? What good is it? You know? You can say, well, Dean told me about this place, so I'm going to go. But if you don't know how to get there, what good is it? There's only one way. It's Jesus Christ. Some of us in the room right now, oh, he's talking religion again. That's what they always do. They always say it's Jesus. It is the way. I didn't come up with it. He did. And whether you realize it or not, it's not a belief system. It's the way it is, whether you believe it or not. You know what my Bible says? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm not saying that to be prideful or arrogant. Really, it's a sad scripture. Because it's better you say it here because there it is too late. And I know some of you saying that's your belief system. And I would say, you'll find out. Don't have to argue with you. Don't have to debate you. You I really don't even have to convince you. You're going to find out sooner or later that Jesus Christ is the way. It's not a belief system. It is a way. It is the way. Some of you got to grab that. You've been trying to get people to believe so much, not understanding. They're going to find out anyway. Your job is just to present it to them. Make sure it's on the table. Give them a chance. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to offend them because they believe this. I don't want to offend them because they believe that. And I'm thinking it's better that you offend them here on the planet because there it is too late. When I got there, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. (laughs) Didn't have to talk myself in. Didn't have to have someone say, well, you know, he's supposed to be in here. I didn't have to have any of that because he lived on the inside of me because I confessed in my mouth and believed in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. He came on the inside of me. So when I was there, he, kid, he looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. A few years ago, me and Alan Kong was on a show together, Fox, because everybody wanted to know what it's like to die. So I get to go a lot of places. <laughs> when you have this, this solid of a evidence that you die, you get to go a lot of places. So I was on Fox with Alan Kong. This was a few years ago. And he was interviewing me. He said, I only want you to come on for five to ten minutes. And so I went up to New York and I went to his studio and I went in there. And he said, well, you're only going to be here about five or ten minutes. Forty-five minutes later. (laughs) Seriously, forty-five minutes later. But one of the things he said to me, and I love it. He said, you say the only way you get in is through Jesus Christ. I said, when I got there, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. He said, but so-and-so says this, and so-and-so says this, and so-and-so says this. I said, but when I got there, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. He said, but doctor, doctor, so says this, and doctor, doctor, so says this, and doctor, doctor, so says this. And I looked at him, and I said, but when I got there, (laughs) Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. Didn't understand a few years later that he would go home. I really believe he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Some of you say, well, how do you know? Because he had me there with him, and he interviewed me. And I told him, when I got there, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. And I remember during the breaks, we had some candid conversations. This morning, I get to tell you what it's like to die as a Christian. 
I get to tell you, I can't tell you what it's like to die as a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I can only tell you what it's like to die as a person that, that has. This morning, I'm going to tell you what it's like to leave this body and go to be with the Father and Jesus. I'm going to cover a little bit of what Kit talked about the prayers. I'm going to cover a little bit of what it's like to come in. I'm going to cover what it's like to meet Jesus. But really what I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize family this morning. I didn't do it in the first service. God didn't want me to emphasize that area. But he wants me to emphasize family. So I'm going to go through some things really fast to get to the part about family. Number one, I came to understand something. When that moment came upon me and I knew I was dying, see, I had a kidney stone stuck on the right side. It caused a kidney infection. They gave me antibiotics, but they didn't go back to check to make sure that it had worked. So when they blasted the stone, they pushed the poison into my body and I became what you call septic. You know, one out of three people that die in the hospital die because they become septic. It's that prevalent, you guys. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And what it is, it's poison going through your entire body and everything in your body is dying. According to the medical records, 29 different things went wrong with this body. And your God healed all 29. And didn't leave a residue. Did you hear what I just said? You know, some of you are living with a residue yet you don't have to live with. It doesn't have to be that way. You know? My wife prayed and others prayed. I called her the general. One of the things that she did is that even after I came back, she wouldn't let anybody in my room where I was in the hospital that didn't believe that I could be totally healed. If people came to the hospital and they start talking doubt, if they start talking, uh, uh, well, I had my cousin like this and he didn't make it, my wife said, visiting hours is over. <laughs> she guarded me. Some of you need to start telling people, visiting hours is over. You know? Did she offend some people? Yeah. Did she make some people mad? Yeah. But look at the results. Look at the results, you guys. I remember when that moment was coming upon me. I remember when I realized I was dying. And see, how I died is I suffocated. I died the worst death I could have died as a little kid. I remember almost drowning. I remember what it was to gasp for air. I remember how terrified I was in that moment. And I used to even come to Jesus often and say, if I'm going to die, don't let it be suffocation. And here I am suffocating. (laughs) And I can remember when I realized I was dying. I said to myself, remember, I went in for a kidney stone, you guys. Anybody who's ever had a kidney stone, you feel like you're dying, but you ain't dying, you know. And I just remember thinking to myself in that moment, I am dying. And the next thing that happened was what rose up on the inside of me. I believe it comes with everybody that's born again, whether you know it or not. What rose up on the inside of me was this. I'm going home. Joy, peace, comfort came all over me, you guys. In that moment. Now, there's something I got to let you know. If you really try to get the details out of me and say, what was it like to suffocate? How did it feel? I can't tell you. Came to understand something. I wasn't there. My body was there. See, my body died. I did not die. You that are born again, whether you like it or not, you live forever. (laughs) You that are born again, you can look to your brothers and sisters right next to you and say, get used to this face. You will see it forever. Some of you got to know somebody. You're going to be with each other forever. You might as well go ahead and start getting along now. (laughs) No. But the reality of it is this, you guys. See, it's like this, and most of us don't understand. It isn't that my body died and my spirit left. It was my spirit left and my body died. In Hebrews, the second chapter, the ninth verse, it tells you that Jesus Christ died your death. It's not just your spiritual death. He died your physical death. When he died on that cross, he felt the pain and the suffering you should feel at that moment of dying. He did it for you already. Is this good news? I know some of you don't believe that because you say, well, I was there when they breathed their last. No, you just saw the body struggling without the spirit. They were gone. What about if they got in a terrible accident? They left before it happened. You got to grab this, you guys. That's what he did. Comes with the package. I don't believe it. That's okay. You get still to experience it. (laughs) 
It has nothing to do with your belief system. It has everything to do with what he's given you. There's a whole bunch of things he's given you you don't believe, but you still get it. Is that good news? You know? So here it is. I left my body. I went to be at the Father of Jesus. How long did it take for me to get there? To be absent in the body, to be in the presence of the Lord. Why do I say that? Because if I say faster than the speed of sound, too slow. If I say faster than the speed of light, too slow. My Bible says to be absent from the body, to be in the presence of the Lord. Faster than you can blink, I was there. But I'm not telling you so that you know how fast I get there. See, what happened is I'm leaving my body and I'm going to be with the Father and Jesus. You know what? I didn't have no guide. Some of you got to grab this because some of you think an angel going to come and get you. No, you don't have to worry about it. You know the way. Whether you realize it or not, you got the GPS already on the inside of you. You don't have to have no one tell you how to get there. You know? So I'm leaving my body. I'm going to be at the Father in Jesus. And as I'm leaving this body to go there, I remember going through the, through the hospital. I remember going through the atmosphere. I entered this area because it's dark. There's no light in it. Some of you hear people say it's like a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, there was a light there, but it was a, like a window to me. And I knew it was what we call heaven. And I was headed toward it. But what got me was these other lights were passing me by. And as Kit said, they were the prayers that people were praying for me and others. Your prayers were beating me there. And the reason for that is most of us in this room don't understand something. You were created to talk to God. Did you know that you're the perfect communication tool for God? He gave you a mouth. Remember when Adam was created? Eve wasn't around. And he had a mouth. He had a voice. Why? Because it wasn't to talk to the animals. It was to talk to God. You know why I do this a lot? I feel like that flag man or that flag woman on the side of the road. (laughs) Pay attention. Pay attention. (laughs) The reason I want you to know this is because I want you to understand your mouth was created for one reason, to talk to God. Your voice was made for one reason, so that God could hear you. Yeah. Well, most of us don't realize that. So here it is. Your prayers are passing me by. I always like to say this because this helps people out, especially you that intercede a whole lot, especially you that pray a whole lot. Your prayers don't have a shelf life. There's no expiration date on your prayers. God's not stamping and said, it's got here. It's got to be done by 2022 or you got to have another one up here. (laughs) Some of us think that he's doing that. But guess what? Your prayers do not have a expiration date on them. All right. When we were in uh, New Zealand, me and Rick, a use by date. Where's that found in the scriptures? There's a story of a man named Cornelius. And he has an angel that comes up to him. And that angel says something to him. Your prayers and your good deeds are a memorial before God. Is this good news? Because some of you have interceded so much. You have prayed for some people. And you're thinking, I ain't seeing no results. But God's still going to work off your prayers even after you leave the planet. Some of you need to build a bigger memorial. Some of you do. You need to spend more time with him. He wants to hear from you. You were created to talk to him. I like this scripture that's found in in, in 1 Peter 3.12. It says, where the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. Someone said, well, he's a good actor up there. I'm not acting. Don't have to. You don't get me in. Jesus does. I'm going to let that sink in. Well, he sounds like he's he's so excited. You go to heaven and see if you don't come back excited. (laughs) We were in in, uh, Ireland, and the British are different. (laughs) Okay? And, And here I am being as excited as I am here. And I'm doing it before all these Northern Ireland people, which are mostly British. Okay? You sure you're from that area? (laughs) 
But I'm telling you right now, that ain't the way they acted. <laughs> and I'm excited about the things I experienced when I was with the Father and Jesus. And I'm sharing it with them. And afterwards, the pastor comes with me and says, well, that was the first time someone said, what did you call it? A, uh, the energy drink. Uh, uh, bull. Yeah. She says, that's the first time I ever seen a Red Bull anointing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't know, but that's what she called it, you know, because they were all sitting there. Mm-hmm, you know what I'm talking about. And I was going at it, you know. But the reality, I don't have to perform. And I said that because I just felt like someone said, well, he's performing pretty good. Don't have to. You don't get me in. Jesus does. But guess what? You don't have to perform either. Guess who gets you in? Jesus. It's all about Jesus, you guys. So here I am. I'm entering heaven. And when I enter in heaven, everything there is glad that I'm there. This morning, I didn't go through the details, sir. For some reason, God wants me to go through the details. I've done it in this church before. When I say everything there, I was glad I was there. Everything there is alive. There's nothing dead. This is going to go outside some of your boxes. This is going to expand your thinking. But remember, even if you disagree with me this morning, as long as you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, you still get to go. I don't get you in. Jesus does. When I entered in, there were animals there. They were alive. They were intelligent. They can talk to you. Where's that found in the word of God? You go to Revelation, the fifth chapter, it tells you that animals came around the throne of God, and guess what they did? They gave him praise. The eighth chapter of Revelation tells you that there's a bird flying around, and what is it doing? Proclaiming things. You read your Bible. It's in there. I would have had to go into each and every one of your Bibles and change the wording, but I didn't. So when I entered in, all the animals that were there were glad I was there. And are your pets there? Kit didn't like this. Years ago when I said it, because old Buffy, you know what I mean? I don't know if you ever heard the story of Buffy. But I said, when you get there, your pets are there. Someone said, well, how, where's that in the word of God? Let's go through it real quick. First of all, you got to understand when animals were created, they were created to what? To live forever. They were created in Genesis, the first chapter. It's not to the third chapter. And it was a man that messed up that everything's deteriorating. I know some of you right now, this is hurting you. You're having a hard time with this because you're not treating your pets right and you don't want them to be there. (laughs) But God created animals to live forever, whether you like it or not. The good thing about it, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying. You still get to go. And your animal's going to greet you in. (laughs) I'm just letting you know that. Don't be surprised when you get there because they'll be saying, you know you didn't believe I'll be here. Buffy's going to come up to you. You know you didn't believe I'm here. <laughs> but the reality of it is, your animals are there. Where else? Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, says this. This is Solomon saying it. You don't know where animal spirit goes, where it goes up. You don't know where man's spirit goes, where it goes down. It literally tells you they have a spirit and a soul. Because the smartest man at the time, which is Solomon, tells you they have a spirit and a soul. You know? You look at Jonah, when Jonah went to Nineveh and Nineveh uh, repented, God comes to, uh, to Jonah and says, wait a minute, why are you upset? There's 120,000 people plus the animals. Read your Bible, it's in there. God cares for animals. He'll save them. You got, you got Noah. He saved animals during that time frame. You got um, Psalms, the 50th chapter, the 10th verse, that says this, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Whether you realize it or not, there he is. He can do whatever he wants with them. Just to let you know that. This I know with some of you. Oh, how can that be? I don't want no animals there. I got to clean up the mess. <laughs> you know how we think. You know? But the reality is God created them to live forever. What's the requirement? I don't know. He didn't tell me. I can tell you in Psalms, the, 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 uh, uh, what is it, the 36th chapter, the 6th verse says this, that God is the one that preserves man. God is the one that preserves animals. The word preserves means save. Look it up, you know. So when I entered in, the animals were glad I was there. What else took place? The atmosphere fi- alive in heaven. The atmosphere there is alive. What do you breathe? You got to remember, you don't take this body with you. It stays here on the planet. Your soul and your spirit go with you. And whether you realize it or not, your spirit and your soul fills up your entire being. His arms, legs, everything. 
Some of you, I know you don't like the way you look, but I'm going to tell you right now, when you get to heaven, you're going to look the same way. <laughs> you're just not going to be deteriorating. You're not going to be falling apart. Yeah. You, you might as well understand that God made you in his image. Amen. And he didn't make a mistake. Amen. You know, and beauty changes on the planet all the time. What looks pretty today ain't going to be looking pretty tomorrow. <laughs> Some of you got to grab what I just said here. Well, so here it is. The atmosphere is alive. You know? When I got there, the atmosphere was glad I was there. Where's that found in the Bible? Revelation 10th chapter says that the seventh thunder spoke. What is thunder? Atmosphere. And it didn't say that something sounded like thunder and spoke. It said the seventh thunder spoke. And then John was trying to write it down. And then he was told not to write down what the seventh thunder said. I know this is breaking. I don't know why, Kit. He's telling me to go. He wants to take you to a different dimension, to a different area. He wants people to understand I'm God. Stop putting me in a box. Yeah. I like what she said. Lord means expansion. Always expanding. Always moving. Something new. Whether you realize it or not, God is life. Life is always moving in a, diff- in a, in a new direction. Let's go to the next one. If this podium was there, if that guitar was there, if those mics were there, they'd all be alive. They can talk to you. Yes, I've seen Beauty and the Beast. Don't think I haven't. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying, well, he must have seen Beauty and the Beast. He's bringing that Walt Disney stuff in here. No, they're alive. Where's that found in the Bible? The ninth chapter of Revelation tells you there's horns on the table in heaven, and they can talk. The 16th chapter, 7th verse tells you that the, top, the table says something. The 19th chapter of Revelation tells you a voice comes from the throne, and it isn't God talking. It's the throne giving praise to God. I'm just telling you. It's in the Word. Remember I said 99% of everything I experience I can find in the Word of God. So when I got in heaven, everything there was glad I was there, Michael. Everything. And it wasn't, like I said this morning, it was like Jesus Christ went before me and announced I was coming. But he didn't do it the day I was leaving this body. He did it the day I accepted him as Lord and Savior. Everybody in this room that's born again, whether you realize it or not, you've been announced. You've been announced. All of heaven is looking forward to you being there. And when I entered in, everything was right. There was nothing wrong, and I fit. Like you said earlier, it's peace peace past understanding. And it's just that way, and you fit. You're not out of place. You fit. Kid, you were created to be in rightness. That's like wrongness you guys can't stand. Most of you can't can't even, what do you say, you don't like it when something goes wrong. The reason is because you were created to be in rightness. That's your natural position. You know? So everything there was glad I was there. This is where I take my why and I go in a different direction because now people want me to describe more of the mountains and the water and the flowers and the colors. But I want to talk about Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you something. I didn't go to heaven to be in heaven. I went there because that's where Jesus is. If you take Jesus and the Father out of heaven, you have no heaven. It's not a place you want to be in. It's a person you want to be with. What did I do when I saw him? I did exactly what the Bible said I was going to do. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I like that song. You can only imagine my wife sings it. But I'm going to tell you right now, when you get there, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going down on your hands and knees. Because you're before your Lord and Lord and King of Kings. And think about it even now. When you have the presence of God in the place or you feel like the presence of God is here, what do you want to do? Go down on your hands and knees. Because you're before your Lord and Lord and King of Kings. When I saw him, like I said this morning, I looked at him and I said, you did this for me? And the reason I said that, because the only reason I was there, the only reason I was there, The only reason I was there is because of what he had done. My good works didn't get me in. Whether you realize it or not, everything I do even now talking to you is him working through me. 
My Bible says I'm supposed to do everything as unto the Lord. He gets the credit. All of my friends that minister, no matter who they are, when they're getting up here, I guarantee you that sometimes what they're saying, they're hearing for the first time too. I even got friends that are ministered that say, I take the, the recording home so that I can hear what everybody else heard. <laughs> He's the one, you guys. What about my bad works? Because everybody in the room usually thinks, well, we're going to come this great way, uh, throwing a judgment and we're all going to be before it. He's going to go over to, to my um, uh, 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 volume of books, bring them off the shelf of the library and put them down and start page one. Well, we're in eternity. Well, we can, we can all stand and listen to everybody's stuff. <laughs> you know, we got all eternity to listen to somebody's wrongdoing. But it ain't going to be that way, you guys. Because when Jesus looked at me, he looked at me like I never sinned in my entire existence. How can that be? My Bible tells me in the 8th chapter of Hebrew and the 10th chapter of Hebrew that when I ask him to forgive me, he forgets it. Most of us don't realize that he doesn't remember it. Sometimes we try to remind him and he does not have any knowledge of it any longer. So what about this judgment we're supposed to go through? You got to understand if there's a book and he opens it up and your name's supposed to be in it. All of a sudden he looks at it. He doesn't see your name. He sees another name. It's called Jesus. When he said he took it, he took it. And some of you, I know that you believe you're the one that always reminds someone of how bad they've done. I'm going to tell you something. You're not working with Jesus because he does not have it. There is one that's called the accuser of the brethren. You're working with the wrong spirit. I could go on this morning. I talked about the love and how he expressed the love to me. But I want to talk about this one area. I didn't believe this way. I had no knowledge of this. This was not part of my box I had built for God. But here is Jesus standing on this side of me. I always say about 10 or 11 o'clock. And on the other side of him was my family. Everybody that had a connection with Jesus Christ that, that was there in heaven that was my family, they came to greet me in. I didn't know that would happen. I always had this idea we're all the family of God. It really doesn't matter. You know, when you get to heaven, you wouldn't even know your family. And yet when I got there, on the other side of Jesus was my family. My grandmother Mary was out front. I always gave her the credit of praying me into the kingdom of God. And the reason is because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. We didn't go to church on a regular basis. Matter of fact, the only time we ever went is Easter. And it was me and my brothers. My mom and my dad would never go with us. But my grandmother, when we went to visit her in Houston, Texas, oh, no. <laughs> She'd wake up early in the morning and turn on the preacher station. <laughs> we had to listen to preaching whether we wanted to or not. If we got hungry because that radio was on the kitchen table, you had to eat at the kitchen table. I remember eating one time and hearing George Foreman preach. Whether you realize it or not, you know the guy that did the grills? He was a preacher at one time, you know? I remember that. So when I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I believe it was because my grandmother Mary prayed me into the kingdom of God. And she was out front. But behind her, listen to this, behind her was generation after generation after generation, after generation, after generation, after generation, after generation, after generation of all of those that were part of my family, they came to greet me in. I didn't know that would happen. Some of you say, well, I'm adopted. Guess what? You're going to have both groups come to greet you in. <laughs> you're going to have your adopted side come to greet you in, and you're going to have your biological side come to greet you in. What about step parents? You're going to have the groups come to greet you in. Do you know you could be grafted into a family? Someone said, where's that scripturally? There was this guy named Jesus on the cross. And he was looking down at these two people. One was named Mary and the other named John. 
And he looked at John and he said, John, Mary is now your mother. He looked at Mary and said, Mary, John is now your son. And according to the word of God, John moved in that day with, I mean, Mary moved in that day with John. You can be grafted into a family. Some of you got to grab what I just said here. Someone asked me even last night, were there there people that you thought were going to be there that wasn't going to be, that wasn't there? And I thought to myself, I didn't think all those people would be there. (laughs) I didn't know that many people in my family had a connection with Jesus Christ. I had Aunt Barbara in hell. (laughs) And there she was in heaven. I had come to know Jesus Christ at the age of 17. I thought I had high year tenure. I don't know if some of you know what that means. That means that you're in the front of the line, and if they're going, anything that's going to happen, they're going to check with you first. I thought for sure Jesus Christ would come to me first before he got someone born again in my family and ask my advice on it. <laughs> some of you believe the same thing. Some of you believe the same thing, that he got to check with you first because you're on the planet and you could tell him whether this person's ready or not. Well, Aunt Barbara, if he would have came to me, there was no way I was recommending her. (laughs) But there I am in heaven, and there's Aunt Barbara. You know? Someone said, well, how did she get there? Well, she had to accept Jesus because that's the only way to get in. Well, when did she do it? I said, I don't know. He didn't tell me. Guess what I found out? It didn't matter if I knew. It mattered if he knew. Somebody better grab what I just said here. You know, it doesn't matter if you know it matters if he knows. You know, family's important to God. I'm getting ready to bust some bubbles here. Ready for this? It is awful hard for someone you're praying for to go to hell. Yes, they do have their own free will. Yes, they can choose whatever they want. Yes, they can do whatever they want to do. But you sent God Almighty after them. He wants them more than you do. In this morning service, I wanted people to understand why they were created. Because we have all these theories of why we are created. And it comes down to this. You're created because God wanted to be with you forever. That simple. He wants them more than you do. Someone said, well, I've been praying for him and I ain't seen anything. doesn't matter what you see. He's working on them. He's coming to them. When there were many people that were dying in the hospital, my wife would go into their room and lead them to the Lord and the family never knew about it. You guys getting this? He ain't going to give up on them. Well, because you don't see it doesn't mean he ain't after. Many of you, when you get to heaven, you're going to be seeing some people you didn't think would be there. You're going to come in and you're going to say, wow, you made it. (laughs) They're going to look at you and say, wow, you made it. (laughs) Family is important to God. I'm going to challenge you because he wants your family. He doesn't usually have me bring this up unless he's after family. He's after your family right now. I'm just letting you know that right now. Some of you want a a confirmation? This is a confirmation. He's after your family. Some of you need to write your testimony down for your family. Not to preach to them. Not to tell them how bad they are, but to tell them how good your God has been to you. And then you need to make sure you give it to them. Well, Dean, they'll just read it and rip it up. Once they read it, it's in them. And guess what your God can do? He can work with it. Did you hear what I just said? No, I'm talking to you. Because someone said, well, that won't work for me. No, it will work for your family. You need to write it out. Don't preach to them. Write out what God has done for you. How he's been there for you. How there's times when you had no hope and all of a sudden God showed up. You guys getting this? You want to know how to reach him? He's telling you. Don't let it pass you by. Some of you can text him. That's a long text. But some of you can text him. Some of you can email him. 
but whatever way, once it's in them, your God can work with it. And that's all he wants. He just wants something to work with. Don't preach to them, please. Don't tell them the scriptures say this and the scriptures say that. Tell them what God did in your life. What he brought you through, how you've been healed. Many of you have been healed in this room. He wants them. Family's important to God. My grandmother, Mary, said something to me as I was leaving. She looked at me, and this is what she said. Bring as many of us back with you as you can. Whether you realize it or not, your family members there want every one of your family members on this planet there. You were created to be with them forever. Now, some of you are having a hard time with that right now. I had a person one time tell me, oh, man, how big is heaven? Because they're on one side. I'm on the other side. (laughs) Everything is right. They're right. You're right. You get along with them. They get along with you. You get to experience family the way God meant it to be experienced. They don't remember anything. You don't remember anything, you guys. If you want to know something, family was created to be together forever. Because family was created in Genesis, the first chapter. You guys getting this? Whether you realize it or not, you were created to be with your family. And you say, well, my family, they all messed up. You know why your family's messed up? Because it's a threat to Satan. He does not go after anything unless it's a threat. Somebody better grab what I just said here. Most of the time, people that come from families that are all messed up, if they could really chase their lineage down, they're going to find out that somebody in that family did great damage to Satan's kingdom and he doesn't want it to ever happen again. 